going. So again, this is uh, not well. Um, make sure that you're aware of this. This applies here to those uh, intermeetings. Um, so this it was supposed to be the, the last um, intermeeting, um, but we we are planning on adding a new one uh, to address the DPOP, uh, to continue that discussion that we started last week. Hannes will be hosting this next week. Uh, is, I, uh, we have a holiday in, in Canada, so I'll be off. Uh, but Hannes will be um, scheduling this meeting and, and hosting it. At the same time, uh, I'm assuming Hannes, right? We're not going to change that, right? Yes, uh, we'll be at the same time. I will send out the note <laughs> to the list with the details, uh, WebEx details. Okay, awesome. A few announcements. Um, we have started work group last call on the um, job profile for access tokens. This was a, a short uh, work group last call. It's uh, it's going to end this week. Um, if you're not speaking, can you please go mute? Um, so if you if you have any comment, uh, please uh, yeah, have a chance uh, to comment on this. And we also started a work group last call on the JOT a response for auth token introspection. This is a document that we we brought back from the IEC, um, and it uh, it's now in a work group last call because uh, there were some um, uh, significant changes um, based on the IEC review. So we're we're it's it's back in the work group, and we are calling for uh, um, the work group to review it and and make sure they are. Uh, comfortable with this before sending back to, to the ISG. And the last thing, I, I am using a new email address because my previous email address was used by spammers and all this stuff. So it's a, I sent an email to the list with this new email. If you haven't received that email, it's probably in your spam emails folder. So you might want to make sure, make, make sure that, that you, you out of that uh, spam folder here. Uh, the agenda for today, uh, Dick will start uh, by talking about reciprocal OAuth, and then Aaron will uh, take the rest, most of the rest of the time uh, to, to talk about client intermediary met metadata. At the end, we wanna kind of reserve 10 minutes uh, to get your feedbacks about those interims, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if you have any uh, suggestions, uh, proposals uh, on how to improve this and, and uh, criticism and uh, whatever, if, if feel free uh, to kind of provide that feedback in, during that time. So that's the agenda. Any any comments about this? Any uh, bashing to this agenda? Okay, good. Let's get going. Um, Dick, do you want to share from your side or do you want me to share from here? Uh, you can go, if you've got it, Andy, go ahead and share. A way to go you I'll, I'll leave it as as this maybe I need to okay. know this first full screen now fancy yep uh, so a little overview here's the whole flow the point of reciprocal OAuth was that there's two parties and each of them would like to get a token to access the other one. Uh, this was a common pattern uh, when I was working at Alexa where uh, Alexa would want to be able to call the, I can't even remember what the things were called, um, but would call you know, the person that wanted to go and have a speechlet and then that speechlet would want to be able to call back to Alexa. And, you know, we, yeah, yeah. I think it was Sonos or something like this, right? Sonos, yeah. And, but it could apply to anybody else linking in. And so 
you know, Sonos at times would want to be able to go and call Alexa, and at times Alexa would want to be able to call Sonos to do things. Um, and so how did you end up with, you know, the, the flow, if you didn't have this, was super clumsy because you would start off, say, at Alexa, you bounce over to Sonos, you get authorization, then you bounce back to Alexa, but then you need to go and get the reverse flow. So Alexa would bounce over to Sonos, it would then go and bounce back to Alexa to get permission from Alexa, that would bounce back over into Sonos, and often the user would have to authenticate you know, at the same site a couple times because they may, they potentially started off in the app, but then would have to authenticate in the web client. And so the goal of this is like, how do we just simplify this UX flow, um, you know, so that it was pretty clear since you already had context in the first party. Um, so this was the proposed document. We then, if we can go to the next slide. Um, we did a working group last call um, with uh, little feedback eventually, um, you know, through sheer pestering. I got some great feedback from Brian and uh, George. Um, and then, you know, that was lots of feedback. And so then I, since I'd left Alexa, I thought, well, does anybody even care about this anymore? I posted that on the working group mail list and it was just crickets, um, which indicated to me that nobody really cared. And so we're now, I wanted to talk about it at one of our meetings to see if anybody cares before I spend a bunch of time uh, addressing all the feedback um, that, that I received on the draft. So that's a question, I'm done. Let's see if there's any feedback, anybody care? Any comments, questions? Do you care? Justin. I'll say that I think it's an interesting use case, but in the same breath, it doesn't really affect anything that I'm trying to solve right now. So I, I don't have any hands on uh, things that I see this and say, hey, I, I can use this for something. So It'd be nice if it existed for, for me, and I might need it someday, but I don't right now, and so I don't care right now. Annabelle? Annabelle? Can't hear you. You're speaking. Can't hear you, Annabelle. Anybody else? Aaron? Just want to say plus one to what Justin said. It sounds like an interesting problem, but I don't have any personal need for this right now. But I understand the problem and it seems cool. Uh, as another piece of feedback, it seems really easy to do this in TXOff because you've got the rich dialogue between the client and the and I added it into the draft I did at XAuth, and it, it's much simpler than how the protocol works um, in the draft that I put for using OAuth. Uh, let's see if Annabelle is back. So, Brian? I just was going to say that I did provide some feedback earlier, as Dick mentioned. Um, but that was largely uh, at a, at, as a result of being pestered, not so much a need or interest in the draft. So I fall more into the people that it, it's an interesting use case, but I have no immediate or, or even near term ish need for something like this. So I, I don't, yeah. my, my feedback was not based on me, but more out of just feeling compelled to do it um, and don't have any particular interest or need in seeing the draft progress at this time. Um, Annabelle, if you can hear us. Okay, anybody else? 
The only other person that had mentioned potential interest was George, but it doesn't look like he's on the call this morning. So, yeah, it, it. Okay. So yeah, it's. Uh, I get. I guess you're getting the same message here. So, yeah, it's interesting, but uh, no need at this stage. So maybe, maybe resurrect this sometime in the future, Dick. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we just put it in stasis and yeah. until if and when people need it. I see Roman. Uh, I was just did, I just wanted to kind of double check. So we're basically saying it doesn't look like there's interest to pursue this right now and we want to park the document. Yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Anybody else has any comments, questions about this? Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dick. Uh, that, that was quick. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, I would hand it to Aaron, so you should be able to share from your side, Aaron. Sure, Annabelle just jumped on the queue a second ago. Oh. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's all I wanted to check. Yeah, plus one to everybody else's comments. Okay. Sorry about that. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, no worries. Thanks, Annabelle. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Okay. So this is um, this is a new draft that I haven't yet brought up um, on the list or anything, but I shared it with a few people at our last meeting, um, just about the the problem that this is solving. So I want to first go through the uh, the use case and kind of set the scene for what the goal of this is before we get into the details of the actual document. Um, so. This is actually primarily driven by, I guess, the user experience side of, of OAuth and the consent feature. So the idea here is that you've got um, an application that's like a, a budgeting app and it's gonna go try to pull um, your financial data from your bank. And in order to do that, obviously, we would like to use OAuth instead of just handing over bank passwords to these applications. And um, when using OAuth, it's gonna show the list of scopes and, and who's requesting the data. That's all fine, and the client ID typically identifies this this application, which is the thing that the user is logging into. So you know the user is using this this app, Budget Bunny. They go and visit the website. They click log in with your bank, get redirected to the bank's authorization server, which would then show the name of the app in this consent screen. This works fine if the application, that budgeting app, is a registered client with the bank's API. That's how OAuth is set up. So in um, in practice, though, this application is actually going to prevent is actually going to provide uh, a lot of different options for different banks, right? Because they want to make sure that they um, that the customers from all the different banks can support it. Which actually means that in reality, uh, what's happening is that the developer of that end user application does not actually register client IDs at all the banks' APIs. In in the in practice, that's just not how it works because there are too many banks and too many applications, and neither wants that many relationships with all of them. So, in in reality, there is this new class of entity in the system which are which call themselves aggregators, and they are the ones that actually have like the legal contracts with the banks, and they provide services to end user applications that kind of. Either, either just normalize bank APIs or roll them up, or at the very least, just provide that um, that relationship. And they're the ones that are sort of registering these client IDs on behalf of the applications. So this is what it looks like in practice: is this end user application is going to go and is going to go be a customer of one of the aggregators, who's going to then have relationships with all the banks. So now the question is, what is the client ID? Because the client ID is um, you know, it's supposed to be the thing that's going to by the application to the user in that consent screen. Um, but the, as far as the banks are concerned, the client ID is actually the aggregator because that's the one that's calling the APIs because they may be representing the bank APIs in a different interface. So just to give you an idea of some real examples of uh, brands that you may see in this, we've got the end user applications on the left, which are apps that you may actually be um, familiar with and may actually be using. 
And then you may have banks that are on the right. And then there's this middle layer of aggregators that you probably never see because they're just sort of moving data around behind the scenes. The problem that this, why this relates to OAuth is because in that consent screen, the banks want to make sure that users are actually informed that their data is being shared with these aggregators, these third parties, or I guess almost fourth parties at that point. So on in practice, this aggregator layer is acting as uh, as the OAuth client to, to the bank API, and then maybe providing a proprietary API to the end user application, and they're acting on behalf of many end user applications. So what that means is that the client ID concept doesn't really fit into this. Uh, so on this consent screen, we actually want to be able to show a list of these intermediaries or these aggregators in the consent screen so that users actually know who their data is being shared with. And that's the part that's missing from OAuth because in OAuth, the client ID is that thing that's, that, you know, the budget money app is, the, it would be represented by the client ID, which then, uh, how do you, how do you add this list of intermediaries into this consent screen, which is presented by the bank. So that's the problem that um, that exists, and as these um, as these companies and other standards groups are looking at OAuth, they're finding that the concepts don't quite map into OAuth. Like their their reality doesn't quite map into it. So my uh, my goal with this draft was basically to create the most minimal addition to OAuth to allow them to build on OAuth for this use case. So the um, what what I, what I did is basically I distilled it down into well what what's missing is this concept of these intermediaries. Uh, so let's add that concept into the registration step, the client registration step. So if you take the dynamic client registration um, draft, it has a section for like client ID and application name and logo and that kind of thing. Um, what this draft does is it extends dynamic client registration to add in these additional properties that describe one or more intermediaries that are actually acting on behalf of the client. And what that does is it lets the aggregators effectively register uh, unique client IDs and provide all the metadata about which names and logos to show on the screen at the bank APIs. And the bank APIs then know how to um, use this, this data model to then present the right information on the consent screen. So the, um, in addition to that dynamic client registration addition, it also then says that authorizations that servers that support this are expected to display this information on the consent screen. So that, um, the idea that that's basically the whole, the whole draft, um, you can read it there. Um, that's basically what the draft says. And the idea is that, um, this is then one of the building blocks needed in order for these financial institutions to pick up OAuth and actually use it for their applications instead of kind of either just doing their own thing on top of it or doing something completely different from OAuth. So my question for the group, I guess, is um, does this sound like a problem anybody else has encountered either in the financial space or in any other industries um, that might also benefit from it? And is there any interest in picking up this work? Um, the one of the one of the other goals I had with this draft was making sure that there's nothing specific to financial institutions in the document. It is meant to be a generic solution for this problem of this intermediary acting between an OAuth application and a uh, and an API. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Comments? Any thoughts? I think Annabel uh, yeah. is in a queue, right? Oh, oh, oh yes, yes, sorry. <laughs> yes, Annabel, go ahead. Annabel Backman, Amazon. I, I'm trying to understand why this use case, I guess why these intermediaries need to be surfaced to the customer if the customer doesn't really know who they are, doesn't really have any relationship with them. Um, what's what's the intent behind that why why are they different from say any other data processor that the end user application might be using behind the scenes or that the bank might be using behind the scenes um like why are they different from say janren i 
I will say I'm not entirely sure the exact answer to that uh -huh. because it is deeply rooted in uh, in the world of finance and regulations and lawyers around that. What I will say is that this has been brought to my attention as a as a demonstrated need, uh -huh. and this screen here is they actually want to make sure that the name that the, these names are included in this screen. So I and I will also say that they are actively working on this problem and trying to make sure that that they can do it within the OAuth space instead of having to go and do something completely on their own. So I don't have an exact answer for you on yeah. that. As my my worry there is that it sounds like someone in the finance space has this idea, has this has this solution in mind, but it's not clear to me exactly what problem they're trying to solve. And if, if this, and so it's hard to gauge whether or not this is really the right solution to that problem. So, okay, I understand that. And what you, what you didn't see in this is what was presented to me originally and what that, would I turn that into in this draft? Sure. So the original, um, draft that I that I received was something completely different and solving this problem in a completely different way, still trying to pull some of the building blocks, but it did it in a very uh, non OAuth way, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to sort of go back to the to the, to the roots and put in the minimal amount in, in this draft so that they could then actually build on top of it properly. Okay. Uh, but but I, this is the screen that is driving the need of, I think... of like this. Right, right, but but the the root of the problem is still unclear as far as what kinds of intermediaries. Why why are we trying to bring this party into the consent process, but not other parties? Um, I, I think unless we have a clearer understanding of what kind of of what an intermediary is, or what why what kinds of parties would constitute that, and uh, what kinds of parties you'd want to uh, surface through there? Uh, it's going to be hard to tell whether or not you know we're 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 designing the right thing or building the right thing. I will see if I can try to find some more details on that, but let's keep going on the queue. Jared, do you have a comment there? I think I might have a scenario where I use uh, could use this today. I uh, support a, a one entity that provides a SaaS solution. They can use external identity providers like, say, Google or Amazon, whatever that is, in an OAuth scenario. But I provide a service that goes in between the two systems. So I need to be able to authenticate, but also tell the user that I will be accessing the SaaS data. So again, it's almost a directly intermediary type of scenario here. And that could be connecting to multiple other entities that they're providing. Now, I don't know if it's the right way to do it, but it seems like that's exactly potentially what's going on here. Uh, Francis? Yes, Francis here, Adorsis. Can you hear me? Okay, uh, the, the problem uh, arises from the PSD2 European regulation because in Europe, uh, in the PSD2 uh, banking, open banking regulation, uh, the European Banking Association requires account information service provider and other third party provider to be licensed. Many fintech applications, what, uh, what, here can be seen as the end user application as small company wide, which are not licensed, but these are the entity that are effectively using those bookings from the banks. The aggregators who own the software, the business process for compliance, data protection are intermediary, and these are the ones which are registered as clients with the banks or dynamically registered as clients or use their third party provider uh, NCA issued certificate to authenticate with the bank. But it's essential to display 
to the end user who is dealing with his data. So by law, that makes it very confusing. In France, they have the concept of a brand name. That's what we're calling end user application. In Germany, the concept doesn't exist yet at all, and it's being heavily discussed because the aggregator need that concept to comply with the law and allow the bank to display the identity of, the, of their consumer, of the end user application to the end user that is providing his consent to the bank to release the data to the aggregator that has to release the data to the end user application. I don't know if I could explain it, explain it better. Yeah, thank you. That does help clear things up. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, Dick? Uh, yeah, I was just going to expand on that, having uh, some familiarity with these models. So to provide a little more depth on Annabelle's question, often these aggregators, they're not just a service in the middle that's passing through the data. The actual customer data is stayed at the, is at the service. And so to meet you know, many of the various privacy and disclosure requirements, um, since that party has the customer data and is managing it, you need to go and say that they're doing it. So often a, a number of these FinTech companies are really built on top of an API of a service that has, as Francis says, has all the regularity things and they're managing all that customer data. And the uh, uh, FinTech company is really just the skin and doing marketing around managing it, but they don't actually have the financial data of the customer. They're, they're not the ones storing that, they're using APIs to manipulate it at the aggregator. Uh, Annabelle? Okay, so from what I'm hearing, you know, if, if, it, if I understand this correctly, then we have the, the aggregator is actually providing a, a different API that is not just kind of mirroring the banking API. Um, and they're not just providing the same fidelity of, of you know, transactional data to, to the end user application. Is that, is that correct? Yes. So if that's the case, then like the consent for the customer between those two relationships, the bank and the aggregator and the aggregator and the end user application ought to be different because the two, uh, the, the aggregator and the end user application are getting access to different things. Yes, which is also why you can't just use the straight client ID because you actually need a pairing you need the user to agree to the pairing of this end user application and this aggregator, which is why those two things are shown on the consent screen. And that's a different agreement from whether they allow the same end user application and a different aggregator. Is that right? Right now, I understand that the there, but the but the consent, like what I'm consenting to, is different, right? I'm I'm, I'm consenting to the aggregator having like full access to my transaction history, but I'm consenting to the End user application having some limited uh, ability to, I guess, introspect or compute on that. Is that right? Uh, yeah, in some cases, and that's up to the bank's authorization server to display that consent screen properly uh, to indicate that. Is the expect is yeah is the expectation that these consents are bundled together such that like if I if I if I consent to allow end user A with through aggregator B to have access that um, if I revoke consent from end user A, that's also gonna revoke consent for aggregator B? Uh, yeah, so this, this okay. pairing becomes one entity that can be granted and revoked. What happens if I, what happens if I'm using multiple end user applications through the same aggregator through the same bank? Are those just uh, completely am. independent authorizations and uh, a 
Okay. So from the customer's perspective, the, the expectation is that if I revoke one, I, I, I revoke at the end user application level, I say, I don't want this end user application to have access anymore. And um, that terminates the ability for that intermediary to have access in the context of that relationship, but it might still have access through another relationship. I think the answer is uh, probably yes. And it is also probably depends on a lot of different circumstances. The, uh -huh. and, and, and as Francis is saying in the chat, it's being heavily discussed right now. So the goal with what I'm trying to do here is put this piece in place so that all those things become possible. Because right now, those, those decisions can't really be made yeah. because you can't set it up right, the right way right now using just plan ID. It's my, so my, to, my to nervousness. Provide a little and... more, to provide a little more context for the Sanibel, the current practice is that users provide their bank credentials to the aggregator. Uh -huh. No, I, yeah, so I understand. Move, there's, right, so there's a move to let's make this an OAuth flow instead of providing the raw credentials. Um, I, I understand. I understand. The, that. My fidelity, my concern the and the, the driver of my question is that if we if we add something into you know if we try to standardize something but there isn't a standardized notion of what it means supposed to mean what it's what it's supposed to be used for, um, then people go off and do all sorts of different things with it and it's no longer effectively not much of a standard anymore because you don't have any interoperability because everybody's interpreting it differently. So I, I want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what problem we're trying to solve and what how this fits into the the OAuth world. Let's go back to the line here, um, Francis. Uh, Francis here. Uh... The problem being solved is the problem of showing the resource owner which permission or which, which authorization is really given. The difference between the end user application and the aggregators is being visibly heavily discussed, like in the stats, the French version of open banking, it's explicitly designed that you can have multiple consent for a single aggregator, each consent mapping the relationship to an end user application. This is correct. In the Berlin group and other uh, initiatives, when you revoke the consent of the aggregator, you revoke the consent of all end user applications. This is not realistic. And we're working very hard on having all this harmonized. So this is a very natural extension of OAuth that is necessary, not only for financials, but everywhere where we are using OAuth beyond identity to share data. Because the data sharing entities are generally designed as to allow aggregators to do the heavy work and allow some companies to build on top of the work of aggregators. The, detail of what data the aggregator forwards to the end user application will also be displayed there, but that will be a detail to deal with later. But the direction of this specification is very important and correct as a complement, as an extension of what is being done now. In Thorsten? Um, this is Thorsten speaking. Um, I think I basically understand the use case, but a bit, um, I'm a bit worried um, that we haven't fully understood what the problem is we want to we wanna solve. So basically, the problem here is not to replace um, online banking credentials with the aggregator with an OAuth flow. That's possible without that extension. The problem, as far as I understand, is that the aggregator itself typically is a client to the uh, banking's, banking bank's AS. But the aggregator in turn um, provides an API to other applications. Um, this can be implemented as two to, to um, independent OAuth flows, uh, in, in which case user would um, consent to um, the data flow on, in, in, in two places, uh, the bank's AS and the aggregator's AS. That's one, one option. 
those combined use cases that um, Francis just illustrated, I think still need to be sorted out. I haven't seen any working implementation in place now, and I would suggest uh, we are looking um, for implementations that exist and to try to better understand what to, what's a problem to solve and how to solve it. And I've got one specific question to Erin, and I, I, I don't fully understand who the client is in your proposal and for what party you want to provide additional metadata. In the fir on the first side, I, I had the impression that the aggregator is going to be the OAuth client, and there is additional data about the end-user application. But when I browse to your draft, it's somehow flipped because there are metadata that I would assume belong to the end user application associated with the client ID. So I'm a bit, I'm a bit confused. So can you please clarify? Yeah, so the, let me share this slide again, um, this one. So the majority of the time, the situation is gonna be that the aggregator is uh, making API calls to the bank's API, which is the thing that granted the token and the consent, and then presenting a proprietary API to the actual end user application, because that's just how they're, you know, it's, it's, it's mint.com talking to an API the aggregator made up to be able to go get transaction data. The bank APIs, who knows what those look like and mint doesn't want to deal with 12 different bank APIs. So in this situation, the aggregator is the OAuth client. However, what the user needs to see is that it's the end user application that is the is the that's what they're expecting to see when they go through an OAuth flow. They're expecting to see Mint is trying to access your data from your bank, not this aggregator is trying to access data. So that's why it's rooted in this in this problem of um, what to show in the consent screen. So what I've got in the draft is the sort of client metadata ends up being the end user application, and then you've got the rest of the intermediaries. But in practice, the thing actually making the API calls is the aggregator. Um, I would like to know that what needs to be shown in the consent screen heavily depends on the jurisdiction. So as Francis pointed out, in the PST2 context, the aggregator is gonna be the license party, and you, you may bet that the name of this company needs to turn up in the user content screen. Yes, that's, that's why I've got that's, this. That's, that, that's, the, that's the controller, uh, but I, I still haven't understood uh, um, how, the, how the metadata is, is gonna work. I mean, can, can, you, can you show an example how a registration um, shall look like? The client registration? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't include a complete registration example in this deck, um, but in the draft, I believe it does, uh, I believe it does include a complete example in the, in the draft itself. Um, let me pull that up. So, okay, here it is. This, this window. So this is the extension of the dynamic client registration step. You notice this is an authenticated call because they are obviously not doing unauthentic, an unauthenticated client registration. So the bank issues a special token to the aggregator to allow it to register these clients dynamically. The basic, um, the information in the uh, core dynamic client registration step like this, which I've heavily abbreviated, is the end user applications data. Or sorry, this is the, um, the end user application data is in this chunk, which is what the user is going to see as the primary application. And that's, that's this the, is an array. That, that's, the reason why, that's the reason why I completely got confused. Because the, so, the client name and the redirect URIs should be the, the data of the of the aggregator. And the end user application in the end is the is the other party, right? Let's not get too deep into the weeds on this specific example, because right now my my main goal is to bring this sort of architectural problem to the to light. And what I found when going through what was um, going through the the documents that that were shared, the drafts that were shared, that where they were trying to 
um, solve this within OAuth, they were doing things like this already by adding these kinds of metadata in to the registration calls, um, doing it in a different way. And I wanted to avoid getting in the situation where a particular industry has gone and made an extension that then is too industry specific and nobody else can use for anything else because it's too deeply rooted in that vertical. So I wanted to- Is, is that already being deployed and used, this other solution? Um, I, I don't remember how many deployments. I think they're still in the stage of they are trying to develop, they're trying to document the standards so that they can deploy it. And that was, that's the sort of weird chicken and egg thing where if, if they're, if they just go and deploy something on their own, it, it then becomes harder to sort of, you know, back up and bring it back into the OAuth core. But they are, this is like an active development situation where they are building stuff. Okay, Annabelle. Okay, so maybe I'm barking up the wrong tree here. Uh, I'm gonna ask about something. So the, is, is, is the expectation here though that the, the bank is the authority on whether or not the end user application has access to data at the aggregator? No, so the way that these contracts work is the bank mm -hmm. contracts with the aggregators and mm -hmm. then gives them the license to sort of, I guess, resell that access. And the banks really don't want anything to do with the end user applications after that. They just sort of delegate that power to the aggregators. Okay, so, so where do I go to revoke access to an end user application? That would be in the bank, the bank's authorization server. So the bank's authorization servers have to support this, obviously. So the bank, so the bank is the authority. Well, I guess it depends on what you mean by authority. So I mean, like, the yes, one the that gets is, to is decide whether the, the, the one, I, I mean that the the bank has final say on whether on on whether an end user application can get access. Um, you know, that that yes. the bank's decision to deny access trumps the aggregator's decision to allow access. Sure, except that in in, in the most of the time, it's going to be just that the banks have a way to. Let users revoke this access they're not going to be enforcing these policies really because they sort of trust the aggregators to do that so uh, is that is is, is is that desired here like do we actually want that model where uh i guess it, it banks have to push that consent revocation to the aggregator is that what happens there um is that what people want I just, where, where, where I'm kind of going with this is, is if I, I, this actually feels like in a, in a way the, the aggregator is a resource server uh, that is, uh, that the end user application is accessing. Um, under the hood, that resource, you know, that resource server is operating on data that it's getting from, you know, the, the bank's resource servers. But um, if I think about like what is the end user application getting off, being authorized to access, it's being authorized to access some kind of uh, you know, set of, of you know, uh, AP you know, resources, not the transaction data itself, but whatever computed resources are provided through these aggregator endpoints. And if, if the bank is managing authorization for that, the bank is managing consent and revocation for that, then you know, the bank's the authorization server here. The end user application is the one accessing the data. So it's the client. Uh, the aggregator is really just providing access to the resources. So if I, if I were to like spin this a totally different way, I could imagine where uh, that OAuth 2 uh, authorization request has, you know, say a resource indicator that indicates the aggregator and scopes that indicate the sort of, uh, you know, kind of derivative resources that uh, 
the end user application is going to access uh, at the so via the aggregate. This makes, this makes sense. I like where you're going with that. I will add though that even if, even in that situation, we need the metadata. We need the name and the logo and things like that of these. Of the, in your example, the resource server. So, it, so you it, need it is you, its own entity. You, so that yeah, metadata you, you, is still important. You need that information, but it comes in at a different place, right? It doesn't need to come in from the end user application making that request. It comes in. No, no, no. This isn't. This isn't the end user making the request. This is the. This is a. This is added in the registration step, to create this entity of with with that well, metadata. Create well, the resource server. It's it's so not in your example. You could think of this as this is the step that creates the resource server at the authorization server. Right. My my well my what I'm trying to say is that that's decoupled from the interaction of the end user application itself. Um, that's, that that's may not also even what I've got here. That may not even be something decoupled. that needs to be standardized. Like maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe that's just part of the dynamic a dynamic client registration between the aggregator and the bank itself. Um, that's literally what I've got. So, but 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 this the is point is though, there, there's no need to to pack a metadata for two different entities into one registration request in that case. Yeah, so I don't. Let's. I, I want to allow uh, more people to join in here. Yeah. So yeah. Online here, uh, Francis, go ahead. Just to mention, uh, we have to distinguish a couple of topics here. One of them is the metadata. What metadata does the bank need to know about the end user application? In most of the cases, there is no contractual relationship between the end user application and the bank. There is a relationship between the bank and the aggregator. But for the sake of managing the Aggregator clients relationship those end user application. The aggregator has to push more data into the bank application. This is, for my uh, opinion, a proper specification. I do want Aaron to bring it forward. The next problem is how do you transfer those information to the bank when you are transferring them in the context of a dynamic client registration? You are doing it once because you are registering the client once, unless you have a client IG Pro and user application. That is the point Thorsten is mentioning. If uh, you transfer it with each authorization request, you have a more dynamic behavior. So we have to distinguish between the specification of what type of metadata we want to manage at the authorization server side of end user application and how. Do we associate every single request with such metadata? And I want to point out for uh, the Thorson specification of the grants management. It's very tied to this because at the end, we need some sort of grant management from the perspective of the end user that would like to revoke those concerns for specific end user application or for the whole aggregators and so on. So there's a lot of work to do here. And I thought this was a good start. And in the background, we can try to match that to the existing specification and pull out something that really fit the needs of all these open banking initiatives because they are building on top of OR2. And like Aaron said, it's very dangerous to let them go forward because they will build things that go off the spec. And it will be better we specify and standardize the structure so that they will keep them into a framework that's reusable. Uh, Tim, Thank you, Francis. Tim, you had a, you had a comment on the chat. Do you want to talk to that comment? Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Uh, yeah, so I mean, the the only the the two personal examples I've seen of this right are um, with Mint and Simplify, which is Simplify is Quicken's um, answer to Mint, um, and they don't sell your data supposedly. Um, and Capital One and Chase both use an OAuth flow with consent. Um, and I think the question was, do they ultimately disclose where the data is stored and being processed? I honestly didn't read the entire consent form. Um, you know, it's buried deep into the terms, but I can relink it and share it with the list if that's helpful to see the flow. Yeah, I think that, that would be useful. And I'm not saying that that's a golden deployment or if it's even following what Aaron 
browsing, but it is the closest I've seen to it in real life. Um, I've cut the line, but I'll, I'll allow Dick because he joined to that. Dick, go ahead, Dan. I'm going to cut the line after Dick. Sorry. Yeah. So I think what um, it may not have been clear in Aaron's presentation, but that registration of effectively uh, client app and aggregator only happens once. It doesn't happen on a per user basis. And I think a way of thinking about the model is that the client is a combination of the aggregator and the thing providing the UX, that the two of them that that, that uh, group is who the client is and who consents being given to, it's being consented, the user's consenting to both of them getting the data. And that the bank is the one that's managing consent and it is the AS or the API the bank is providing to the aggregator. The API between the client and the aggregator is proprietary. And from an OAuth point of view, we should view that all of that, that combination of uh, UX component and aggregator is the client. But uh, maybe we should take this to the list to go into more detail on it. Yeah, it, it, it seems to me that there is lots of interest here and, uh, and it's an interesting problem, but uh, I don't think we are, we are we're ready to adopt anything at this time. So uh, let's continue this discussion on the. On the Uh, okay, I want to spend I want to spend the last six minutes here um, to talk about um, those interim meetings. As as you know, guys, um, we, we are doing those because uh, Vancouver was cancelled, and I'm expecting uh, a few of the coming meetings also to be cancelled. And we'll be probably hosting those um, virtually. Um, so we want to get get feedback from you guys on on this series of meetings and. Um, what's good, bad, and, and ugly, and uh, how to improve it, and, and go from there. So, uh, was it helpful at all? <laughs> That's the question to begin with. Yeah, so uh, I think Dick is the first. Um, yeah, go ahead, Dick. Yeah, I think we, we got a fair amount down. I think we hit time pressure almost on many of the topics we were doing. Um, so a suggestion going forward would be maybe only having one topic or maybe longer period of time. I think it's easy for everybody to go and end early, um, but we all have to end at the end of the lot of time. That would be my one suggestion to improve it. You know, it doesn't seem like we're necessarily as efficient in the virtual meetings as we do are in a physical meeting because we don't have all the same signals you know, whoever's speaking doesn't really know, oh, I think I've lost everybody's attention. And as chairs, I'm sure it's hard for you to see, you know, understand whether there's consensus or not. But I found them productive, just short of time often. Good feedback. Thank, thanks, Dick. Hey, Aaron? Yeah, same. I felt like he's been very productive. Um, definitely would like to keep doing them. However, we've always been cut short, I think, every single meeting. Um, so I like the idea of either one topic per meeting or maybe 90 minute calls uh, instead, because I think th they have been very helpful. And um, I think it's actually even sometimes in, in some ways, it's actually more um, helpful having them virtually than trying to pack everything into the you know two two hour sessions we get at the IETF meetings. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. So so we, we wanted to limit it to one to one hour just to, because we don't want to an hour and a half and in two hours you might like people might get like uh, distracted and 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 it's too, might might be too much uh, so that that's the reason we wanted to limit it to one hour but uh, the idea of limiting the one hour to to one topic I think it's a good idea unless the the topics are are small and whatever so so but yeah we'll we'll take that into into consideration good feedback uh, just. Yeah, plus one to uh, to one topic per call. However, I will say that uh, this setup of a series of calls with multiple topics to kind of 
feel out where things are has been very useful. And I think that uh, at this point, hour long virtual calls for specific single topics uh, would be a good idea. I don't think that if we had started with um, all of these split out into hour long talks that it would necessarily have gotten us where, uh, you know, where we are, even though there have been a bunch of conversations that have been cut short and we, it, it, because those have been cut short, we now know where we need more attention. So, so uh, one topic, and and do do like, and again, I'm asking that the group. Do you prefer an hour per topic, or do you want to extend that to one hour and a half, two hours, or is that too much? Right. One, one hour is yeah. uh, is what I would respond. Um, I think anything longer than an hour is hard to fit into schedules. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and that's that's the the rationale. Uh, the one hour here. Hey, Annabelle. Uh, yeah, mostly one of plus one Justin's comment, uh, reiterate like a one size fits all approach isn't really isn't appropriate here. Um, there definitely for, for topics that have be become a little bit established, one hour for just that topic makes a lot of sense, but we may also want to have um, possibly on a, on a separate schedule, a sort of, um, uh, almost like a, a not, not almost like a dispatch kind of meeting where you know we can hit some of the new business new topics that we're not sure if there's interest in them or not if they warrant a whole a full uh, session um, to to kind of feel those things out. Okay, good feedback. Okay, anybody else? Lots of support for one one hour, one minute, one topic. It's good feedback. Anybody else has any comments, suggestions, critique? Okay, awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, for that feedback, and um, uh, we will meet uh, next week uh, for our last session for this this time. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy your week. Thank you, guys. Bye.